Mike. everything that I've lived through. It's Psalm 91, which is, The Lord is my fortress. I'm going to skip ahead to where it says, The Lord will keep you safe from secret traps and deadly diseases. He will spread his wings over you and keep you secure. His faithfulness is like a shield or city wall. You won't need to worry about dangers at night or arrows during the day, and you won't fear diseases that strike in the dark or sudden disaster at noon. You will not be harmed though thousands fall all around you. And with your own eyes, you will see the punishment of the wicked. The Lord Most High is your fortress. Run to him for safety, and no terrible diseases or disasters will strike you or your home. So this is the story of my life. Um, and the scriptures and my relationship with God meant something to me. I grew up in a Christian home, but until I came to the place of desperation, I wasn't walking by faith. I was walking by fear most of my life. And... I just want you guys to know that it doesn't have to come to that point of desperation. It did for me because I drug my heels in the ground for so long to the point where I needed God to save me in a very real way. Not just, oh God, I need to get into heaven. It was, God, I'm dying, like now. I'm not in touch with my family, and it was such a broken place. So you guys don't have to get to that broken place. And that is the main message that I want to share today. Um, so my name is Rebecca Heichman. I am 31 years old. In 2019, I surrendered everything to Christ, and he delivered me from over 10 autoimmune diseases, chronic Lyme disease, chronic C. diff, which almost took my life, um, SIRS, severe mood disorders, digestive issues. My medical issues began in sixth grade. I was diagnosed with osteoporosis. Um, all throughout my childhood, I was on antibiotics. I was constantly getting sick all the time. And I actually, at one point, at the beginning of this journey, you can pay to get all of your medical records printed out. So I had a stack this big, and all I saw was antibiotics. I mean, over I must have done over 300 rounds of antibiotics from ages 6 to 10. Um, and I know that that is a huge part of what really broke my gut, why the C. diff took over. C. diff is like a sissy virus, but it took over. I could not gain weight to save my life. I had three fecal transplants. Um, I literally tried everything and it was taking over. And it was not until I cut out the vegetation from the keto diet that I was able to heal and seal my gut. Um, but there's so much more to it. So diagnosed with osteoporosis in sixth grade. In seventh grade, my family moved from my childhood home to North Carolina. It was a really hard time. Um, and I was struggling with my changing body, puberty. I was taping my breasts down. I hated the attention from older guys. And I was diagnosed with OCD, anxiety, depression, insomnia, and narcolepsy. And I was put on Adderall, clonazepam, and Ambien. And I was told that I could take those long term. I was told that they would not be addictive or harmful. You shouldn't take benzopidines for more than 30 days. I took them for 13 years. So that's another reason my gut was destroyed but I was running on higher and higher doses of those. Um, they, didn't, they didn't help, they just masked my symptoms. I basically became a zombie. It stole a lot of my personality. I was on speed during the day and knocking myself out at night. I got up to 85 milligrams of Adderall. I was, many times I would overdose on accident. My eyes would be <laughs> obviously overdosed. My mom would actually laugh at me because I did it so often. <laughs> She's like, you'll get through it. Um, and it was just who I was. I was told by doctors that that was my only choice. You have a mood disorder. And, and I would just pop these like, like candy. Um, then in high school, moving into my higher eighth, eighth, ninth, tenth grade, I started running into chronic pain. Started seeing a chiropractor, physical therapy in Raleigh, North Carolina. I got dry needle therapy. I did all the things and I had no relief at all. So. At this point, I was taking also diphenhydramine or Benadryl, as well as NyQuil and my Ambien to get any sleep at night. Um, I was staying awake for five days at a time. I had horrible insomnia for years, and I never thought I would be better from that. My central nervous system was a wreck. I had horrible cystic acne. I spent two hours every morning when I was in real estate just covering up my acne, and then another half hour during my break trying to cover it up again. That was a nightmare. Um, and so I, I was on the ketogenic diet off and on for over 15 years. I have a relative who is versed in it. She wrote a book. She does retreats. She doesn't want to be mentioned. 
but I would help her at her retreats, and that's what inspired this, actually. And so I grew up in a home, we didn't have a standard American diet. My mom never bought us pop. We didn't have candy in the house. Um, the most I would get is like chocolate chips and my peanut butter sandwich or something like that. And so keto helped me a lot. I came to a point where I was having suffocation attacks. My fists would be clenched shut. My arms would be glued to my side. I would be in a ball. I couldn't breathe and I would have to be carried into the emergency room. And this was happening when I was engaged, working full-time in real estate, trying to plan a wedding. And um, after that happened so many times, I broke off the engagement and my, I moved back in with my parents. And they would just tell me it's just anxiety. And then they would give me morphine. I don't know how that makes sense. Um, and I definitely, liked morphine. I will also just be totally transparent with you guys. There's nothing that I need to hide. I was addicted to opioids. I was in pain all the time. I was stealing my dad's pain medications for a while um, until my cousin, I told my cousin, he's like, you have to get off these. So I got off of them. Um, but just my whole life was just, just take a pill. No one told me anything about nutrition except for keto, which I was like, there's something to this. So that is why my coaching business is called Taylor Keto Health because in 2017, after I was diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease, I had non-epileptic seizures, I was bed bound, and I decided I'm getting off of these medications even if it kills me, if they're not helping. And I started seeing the Lyme literate doctors doing those treatments and I realized this isn't sustainable because now they want me to pay thousands of dollars to get IV treatment every week and people lived there. And I didn't want that to be my identity. So I was like, I'm not doing this, but I'm not gonna do this. So I did a strict ketogenic diet, four to one fat to protein ratio. And that was enough to get me out of bed. I was still very much struggling. Um, if you are subscribed to me on YouTube, I left my first videos on there to see, just so you guys can see how broken I was. I couldn't even string words together properly. I was very emaciated and very much struggling. And so I thought keto was the thing. And I was very obsessive about tracking ketones and glucose um, because I didn't want seizures. And then at some point I started losing rapid amounts of weight. Everyone says, well, you're on the ketogenic diet. Of course you're losing weight. And I'm like, I'm doing this because I have autoimmune symptoms. And, um, but no one believed me. Even a child neurologist in Raleigh, North Carolina, they were like, you have an eating disorder. Um, I did work with Dr. Eric Westman in Durham for a while. And he believed me and he's like, keep doing keto, but he didn't really have advice for me for the Lyme or anything like that. Um, and so I've, I've had a couple of carnivores in this community come alongside me when I was very sick, but truly I had to figure this out myself and God is who saved me. Um, so I tried carnivore eight times and every time I felt worse, I was doing just beef, salt and water because that's what everyone says you should do. And I would have strangers even on Facebook from forum, forums messaging me saying, Rebecca, just do the beef, salt, and water. What's the problem? And I just couldn't stick with it. Um, and I decided, you know, if I have to gain weight, I can't do something this restrictive. I can't do this. I feel worse. And so then I discovered it's a histamine issue with the beef. I was eating a ton of ground beef. And so um, in May of 2019, I had moved to Illinois because my family no longer was in contact with me because they thought I had an eating disorder. Um, I'll back up a little. I was held against my will in an eating disorder unit in Chapel Hill, UNC, for an entire month. Um, I was supposed to be there for longer. I checked myself out against medical advice. My parents said, if you check yourself out before a month, we won't let you live at home. I had nowhere to go. Um, most of my friends were not talking to me at this point. My entire family, extended relatives, thought I had an eating disorder, all the doctors, were calling my mom and saying, you can't trust anything your daughter says. She has an eating disorder. They threw away all of my supplements while I was gone. I, I mean, over, you know, you guys know how much money you spend on supplements. They went into my closet, ransacked it, <coughs> threw away all the supplements because now I have orthorexia. And in that eating disorder unit, I did not poop once until they gave me a bottle of magnesium citrate. I had so much pain. And after that, I had my first keto rash. The keto rash is oxalate dumping. If you guys don't know that, it's detox. And it was all over my face and back for three months after that. Um, and that, if you, you guys all got a copy of my book, that's what you'll start reading is me in the eating disorder unit. And it was a, I learned a lot in there. Um, and so I tried carnivore a couple more times, it didn't work. I'll fast forward to May of 2019. I'm living in Illinois because I met someone on eHarmony. Again, my family's not talking to me. 
And so I made a profile in eHarmony saying, I'm really sick, I'm gonna die soon, and I don't want to die alone. I wanna meet a Christian man, and just fully transparent, and I met someone, and he ended up being not who he said he was. Um, and so I'm living in Lake Forest, Illinois, we're sleeping in separate bedrooms. I don't, I don't even think we kissed, actually. <laughs> but um, he was manipulative, and he said I had an eating disorder, and, but I look back and I can see why. I was so obsessed with the ketogenic diet because it's all I knew that could even start to alleviate my symptoms. And so in my third executive emergency room, because my electrolytes were all over the place, they said, we're gonna have to remove your colon and hook you up to a feeding tube. And that was my moment of breaking. I, said, I don't want a feeding tube cut. <laughs> and, um, and in that moment, I just surrendered everything. And people always ask me, what does that mean when you say you surrendered? It means I'm saying, God, I don't know what it looks like, but I'm giving it all to you. And I really felt God convicting me of keto because it was an idol in my life. I love the ketogenic diet. It's great for so many people, but for me, it became an idol. And so God took it away. And he told me, you have to surrender this. Um, I had a severe binge eating disorder at this point. It wasn't there before the eating disorder unit. It was there after the eating disorder unit. That was very traumatizing. And so um, I surrendered all the keto stuff and I realized I'm gonna do this carnivore diet in a way that works for me. It makes sense. Animal foods are the most bioavailable form of nutrients were created to digest meat. But I just decided to draw outside the lines. So I spoke with the dietitian, literally told her everything I've told you guys up until this point. And she got in touch with the chef in the kitchen at the hospital, and he was calling up entrees of meat, hard-boiled eggs, and butter. And so I was throwing away the trays of carbs and equip shakes, or not equip shakes, um, the crappy shakes, weight gain shakes, and sure. I was throwing those away, hiding them. Remember, I have C. diff, so everyone has to come into my room head to toe covered. They had booties on, they had capes and everything, so I had my privacy in there. And I was scarfing down hard-boiled eggs, butter, and pork like no one's business. And I gained four pounds in one week. My involuntary throwing up from the ulcerative colitis stopped in that emergency room. Blood in my stools stopped. Um, my blood sugar stabilized, no more glucagon shots. And finally, the doctor came in and said, you're stable, we don't know what to tell insurance, go home and do your weird all-meat diet. <laughs> <laughs> that's what she said. <laughs> and so that's what I did, and I went home back to that toxic person, but I had a backbone this time. I knew God was on my side. I knew he was gonna, I knew he was providing. And I, I put away my glucometer, I stopped tracking my ketones, and I said, this is, I'm doing it your way, God, I'm trusting you. And it's been uphill from there. Um, I did need to find a place to live, so I was sending messages on Craigslist. I was knocking on neighbors' doors. I was a different person, and I was desperate. And even the police in Lake Forest know me. They knew me, they would check on me. Um, all the women's shelters were booked. This was during the holidays. They couldn't take me in. So finally one day, the guy I'm living with is like, I'm gonna start charging you to live here until you find somewhere to go. So he made an account on Airbnb. And so I was on there to pay him. And I was like, I'll just send some messages to strangers while I'm here. And I sent a message to Tyler. And I said, I'm sick, I need a place to live. And he said, well, I have a bonus room. You can come stay with me. <laughs> and I said, what's the catch? And he's like, no, look, at, I have good reviews. I'm not a creep. And, um, <laughs> and then I went to go meet him that night. And what was so cool is that his house that he was letting me live in was in the ghetto of Waukegan, Illinois, next door to one of the shelters I was reaching out to. And I saw that shelter and it was so run down. And it was just God saying, you could have gone here, but I provided this instead. Mm -hmm. Literally next door, you could see it from my bedroom window. And I thought Tyler was gay when I first met him. <laughs> we all <thought> <laughs> I, it was just keeping my head down and doing this way of eating from there on out. Um, we didn't get together until, you know, over a year after I moved in with him. He moved out. He was living in a different house. And I could share those details, but the most important detail is that from there on out, God was taking care of me. And I no longer had this burden on me to figure it out. And that was walking in faith. And that's what saved my life. Everything made more sense. You know, God literally gave me my critical thinking skills back. I was getting out of this place of fear and, and just having to defend myself and realizing God is fighting for me. Um, and so I gained 65 pounds in one year. 
from 69 pounds at five foot six all the way up to 155 in one year. I reversed every single diagnosis, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, Crest scleroderma, which was taking over my lungs, um, fibromyalgia, Raynaud's, ulcerative colitis, SIRS. I had many diagnoses. I have a list of them if you guys would like them, but they were very real and very much taking over my life and they were all reversed with labs confirmed, as well as the Lyme disease. So I'm not saying the word remission, I'm saying reversed, because there is not a trace of it. I literally just did labs again at the beginning of this year because we had a miscarriage in November, and I wanted to make sure nothing had come back. Everything looks great. Um, only God knows why we had a miscarriage, but he definitely blessed us with David. And so that is uh, the summary of my journey. Amen. I will say, um, when I was trying to heal, I worked with a lot of functional medicine doctors and I reached out to someone in this community, Paul Saladino, and he was charging $900 for a one hour call. What? He did a free one for me because I couldn't afford it. And But after that one hour, I had questions. It's like, okay, I did what you said, but then I need to troubleshoot. And they're like, you have to pay for another call. So the reason I offer unlimited coaching, the reason I'm on call for my clients is because I know what they need. I want to work with people who need someone to walk alongside them, who, you know, I want people to text me throughout the day. I'm, I'm you know, I'm having diarrhea or, or I need help with a recipe or I'm anxious. Pray with me. And that's what has inspired the style of my coaching. I only take on so many clients because a lot of people need that. Some people do great with just groups. Some people do great with a stock meal plan, but some people need more attention. And I was definitely one of those people. Yeah. Yeah. Taylor, when you talk about putting it in God's hands, um, I mean, that's how I look at it. You say walk in faith. Um, if anybody's still kind of struggling with what that looks like, for me, it's when I'm going into something where I'm like, oh, you start to feel tightness and you're kind of scared. I just say, God, I'm putting it in your hands. And the instant relief is like, you can just feel it. And it, what it does is the thoughts that come to you then are you have confidence in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you're like, all right, I'm going to do this. And it's going to lead me here and here and here. And sometimes God has a humor of Jesus. And I'm like, well, that was funny. It's the most freeing feeling to live your life like that. It's so beautiful mm -hmm. it's when you get out of your own way. My right. whole life I've been a AAA perfectionist. Um, and I struggle with that in some ways, but I'm a lot better. <laughs> I'm definitely a lot better, and there's not that pressure anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's okay if I'm imperfect. Um, I mean, we all are... are struggling with their own issues but it's like it's a reset every morning that's why i spend time in the word i have to and then there's freedom in that mm -hmm. definitely something that something that helped really significantly was affirmations um i know brain retraining is a popular topic right now with everyone god's word has already taught us brain retraining <laughs> he talks about renewing his mind taking your thoughts captive and making them obedient to what god's word says so that's what i did any thought that came into my head um, like you're going to get sick again or you need to track your ketones. I would literally find what God's word says about me. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He's watching out for me more than he watches over the sparrows. Like if, if I really believe in this God, he's not lying and I need to live like this. And so I would speak affirmations over myself three times a day. Like it was my medicine and it changed my mind. And so I highly encourage that for anyone. I don't think there's much more to it. I have done visualization. It's just praying and imagining, hey God, I would love to be the strong aunt for my niece. I would love to be able to play with her, and I am now. Yeah. Um, I would love to have a good relationship with my family, and I do now. He's restored that. Mm -hmm. And that praying is visualization. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's very practical, but God's word has already provided for that. Mm -hmm. You had a question? I've heard one other person mention something about this to me. Yeah. Histamine, histamine is basically um, so. Histamine is a neuromodulator. It's actually a good thing. 
but histamine buildup can occur in our digestive tract or our tissues, and then we get the histamine intolerance symptoms. And so histamine is built up basically the longer that protein is exposed to the air. Mm. And so a cow, 1,500 pound cow, takes longer to process than a you know, 50 pound lamb. So the smaller animals are gonna be naturally lower histamine, but all the meat that I'm serving you is non-aged. Billy Doe Meats doesn't even use aging. Even their beef is non-aged. That's very rare, and they were a gem for me. Um, they have just come alongside me in my whole healing journey and have been such an encouragement, but their meat was a game changer for me. And so histamine intolerance symptoms could be runny nose right after you're eating, heart palpitations, diarrhea, anxiety, those are all histamine intolerance symptoms. Not saying all anxiety comes from histamine, but it's definitely one of the major symptoms. Um, and so I was having huge issues with that. Rebecca, is that like right after you have a meal? Yes, it is usually shortly after the meal. Yep. So meat sweats? Meat sweats are just too much protein. <laughs> and I get them all the time when we go to Pogo. <laughs> So you were on some high doses of some very addictive medications for way longer than you're supposed to. Um, did you experience uh, protracted withdrawal? Like it's something that's just kind of yes. come on people's radar recently where you can yep. have an acute withdrawal that's yep. short term and horrific, but then months and months later you can still be having withdrawal <laughs> symptoms. Yeah, he was nobody, a year later. Nobody can accept that. The clonazepam was the, the C. diff was the hardest thing I've ever battled because I could not gain weight to save my life. The clonazepam was the second hardest thing I ever battled getting off of that. My parents forced me to take the medicine when I was living with them because I was a nightmare without it. And I was down to like a crumb of a pill and it wasn't placebo. That stuff is so powerful. Um, so it took me about a year to get off of it. I felt okay for a year and then the symptoms came back like I had just gotten off of it. And I've worked with a lot of people to get off of benzobedines and that is, those are some of the hardest situations. You've got to go slow. Don't go cold turkey. Um, that can cause like permanent issues. Um, but that was very difficult, definitely. How did you? I've, I've worked with a lot of psychiatrists who um, are pretty ignorant about it. How did you have to have, find one that had that on their radar? Or I did it. Doctor that had that. I did so, it myself. I got a pill cutter. I got a big um, bead organizer, and I just said I'm going to go down after two weeks. And keep. I just did it myself. Did you, um, go ahead. Did you have like, um, did you find something online about doing an extended searched, taper like that? Or, or? I searched and the main thing I was seeing is don't go cold turkey. Yeah. Um, I saw you could take this medication while you're getting off of this. I didn't want to get on anything else. Mm -hmm. I was truly prepared to die as long as I didn't have to take those medications anymore. So I just, I just did it slowly. Um, the ketogenic diet did help with a lot of the symptoms, the anxiety and stuff like that. But I was floating in ketones. My ketones were like 7.0. Blood sugar was always 65 or under. And that was the type of therapeutic ketosis that I actually needed during that time. Um, but that's not forever. And that was a lesson I had to learn for sure. Audra? So I just want to say thank you for putting on the retreat. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you for being just plain clear and crystal clear and, you know, not not putting on a buffer or anything like that. I mean, you've overcome a lot of things in your life where a lot of people would have just waved a white flag and said, I surrender, I give up. I mean, you know, there is hope. There's so many autoimmune diseases that we have now that we've never had before that so many people have and they don't even realize what could be different. Yeah. You know, um, and the C. diff thing, wow. I know so many people who've had that who have been, like, permanently damaged from it because it's that horrific. But thank you for putting on the retreat. Thank you for mm -hmm. having everybody. Thanks for all that you bring to the community. Your light just shines so brightly. Mm -hmm. You just have that glow about you, and people are just attracted to your story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Martha? Silly to ask it now, but I had one with the histamine. Yeah. Is that something that you recover from and then you can eat aged beef? Yes, yes. So I can eat as much aged beef as I want now. Because I never, my nose, and I'm like, my nose has been running after I eat. Healing the gut is a big part of it. And then also just allowing, um, it could be a DAO enzyme deficiency, it could be vitamin C or copper deficiency. 
But before you go down that rabbit hole and start taking those supplements or something, mm -hmm. just cut out all of the high histamine foods. A lot of people go carnivore and they're like, now I have histamine intolerance, but it's because you've never consumed so much histamine before. Mm -hmm. It's just a shot to your body. So you have to find that balance of, um, remember histamine is a good thing. It's right. a neuromodulator. So it's just a build up and everyone has to find their balance, but healing the gut will definitely um, confront the issue. At, at the root. And that's something I also like to focus on is not working on symptoms in isolation. I focus on let's just support the body at a systemic level, remove the interference, provide a proper foundation, and your body will dictate what it wants to heal first. I didn't gain a lot of weight in the first couple of months very rapidly because my organs were repairing. And there are things that are gonna happen under the surface before you see your results on the outside. And that goes for anyone losing weight or gaining weight. And so histamine intolerance was just one of those things. My hypothyroidism was um, reversed around the six month mark. Got my period back around 104 pounds. Like there, I could tell my body was prioritizing things in different seasons mm -hmm. and I had to be okay with that. Yeah. How do you feel about fasting? I know it wasn't part of your therapy, but those of us that have some extra. Yeah, <laughs> so days. I did use fasting when I was underweight until I realized I can't do this anymore because I'm underweight. And it felt great, but the issue was that when it was time to eat again, I almost felt worse. And my digestion was just a wreck, and it's like, this is not really helping me that much. I think fasting is great when you're already pretty healthy. When your hormones are stable, you're sleeping through the night, you have good energy during the day, I think fasting is awesome. I think everyone should be intermittent fasting. Never through this entire journey, even at 69 pounds, did I eat, you know, um, I was always doing 16-8. Okay. Everyone needs insulin to get low for human growth hormone to get high. Okay. And that's a huge part of healing. So, But extended fasting, I think you have to be in the right season for it. I think that it's overused, to be com completely honest. I think a lot of people get into it because you can lose weight, but is that sustainable? Are you just going to keep doing rolling extended fasts? You know, the snake diet. So many of those people are like, I gained it all back when I started eating normally again. So I would rather you repair your hormones, raise your resting metabolic rate, so you naturally are burning 2,200, 2,500 calories a day, mm -hmm. and then you don't have to starve yourself to main, you know, maintain a healthy weight. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So how long did you do strict carnivore before adding back in other foods, and what made you decide to do that, and where are you now? Great question. So I did strict I'll say the first two months after that hospital room, I allowed myself dairy and stevia because my number one goal was to gain weight. I didn't want to be on a feeding tube and those things helped me to eat more. After those two months, I cut out the dairy and stevia and I did just billy dough meats, salt and water for an entire year. No Redmond Relight, no Equip Foods Prime Protein for a whole year and that's when everything was reversed. Once everything was reversed with labs to confirm and I was feeling good, I started weightlifting again and I incorporated, that's when I discovered Equip Foods, so I made the carnivore brownies. Um, I started doing sweetened things, but with a lot more mindfulness, so I only do protein heavy sweet treats. The cake that Maria made was in my red zone, as Lisa you know, has described, that would be in my red zone. I would not make that for myself because it was fat. <laughs> it was just fat and chocolate. <laughs> I could eat so much of that, but the prime protein is super satiating, and it, it really works for me, not for everyone, yeah, and that's clear. I think you redeemed yourself. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm, I'm going to finish this question. Um, so I started reintroducing other things. I reintroduced romaine lettuce and coconut were my first like non-animal foods in small amounts, tiny amounts. I did it because low oxalate basically. Um, and I introduced eggs or egg yolks and butter after the first year. I didn't do well with butter. I got arthritic symptoms after three days. So I removed it, waited another six months. I introduced whole eggs after about two years. That was really exciting. <laughs> <sighs> um, and, then, and then recently, this past year, I've reintroduced um, popcorn, sourdough, homemade sourdough bread, apples, berries. Um, I am not afraid of things that I never thought I would be able to eat again without being triggered to binge or spiking my blood sugar. And what's cool is that neither of those things are happening. So make one thing at a time and see what the result is. Yes. 
pile it all on and then have Definitely. to figure out what has yeah. triggered symptoms. For food reintroductions, I usually say, you know, say someone is reintroducing egg yolks, I would say try one egg yolk, wait three days. Some people say, well, if you did good, do another one the next day. I actually say wait three days because it can take some time for you to have reactions if you're very sensitive. And then if you're fine after three days, try two egg yolks and then start doing it every day. And if you're fine, then you're fine. If you have any symptom, then you know what it was. But definitely do one thing at a time. It will save you a lot of time. Um, kind of back to your fasting comment. 16-8, do you recommend that every day or should you sometimes vary it a little bit? Maybe do three meals a day and then back to 16-8. I mean, you could do three meals a day in, in eight hour eating window. I don't really, it doesn't matter how many meals you eat in that eight hour eating window, but I think that if someone is uncomfortable with 16 hours of fasting overnight, then your adrenals need to be healed. And so for that person, I would say, please don't eat protein at night because that will raise your insulin and, and interfere with melatonin, human growth hormone, serotonin, but you can eat pure fat outside of your eating window to kind of help you become fat adapted. But once you're fat adapted, it shouldn't be a struggle. For me, the butter on the bedside trick was huge. Um, just take little bites of butter before bed in the middle of the night if you wake up first thing in the morning That's gonna send that signal to your body that it's supported. It's got fuel and it's fat. It's not sugar Your brain wants sugar when you're waking up during the night Maria was saying it could be progesterone But it could also just be that your body is wanting glucose And so I always use that as an opportunity to eat a little fat and send that signal that you're supported Can you find out if it's fat or uh fat or protein or glucose that you need by wearing a CGM, and if you're not spiking or going low, then you know it's probably fat that you need? Not necessarily, because your cortisol, your adrenaline will probably rise as well, which can spike your blood sugar, and so you might not think, oh, I have low blood sugar or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I actually would still do the fat. No matter what, fat will raise your serotonin and lower cortisol, just like carbs. People are like, oh, well, you need carbs to lower your cortisol. Fat mm -hmm. does the same thing. Mm -hmm. Really? Just don't do them together. <laughs> Jackie? Um, was Tyler carnivore or just, you know, pizzas every day? Tyler was, Tyler was that fat for him. <laughs> he was, um, he was chunky. He had man boobs. And, uh, <laughs> 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 but he was a gay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got soup every day. So yeah. Late, so, I mean, I was McDonald's and pizzas three times a week for like three years. He was very unhealthy, seed oils every day, addicted to sugar. He was eating those personal cheesecakes that you buy with the different kinds. Mm -hmm. He would buy one for himself and eat them. Oh. <laughs> um, cinnamon rolls at midnight. And so he thought it was crazy when I first met him. And, and then I confirmed it. <laughs> um, but he came to my first retreat and that's when he when he was convinced to go carnivore. I remember him listening to Sally Norton talk about oxalate. She's like, yeah, peanut butter, potatoes. He's like, this is my whole diet. <laughs> <laughs> and then he went carnivore and he, the inflammation just fell off of him. He got oh, shredded. And I will say he was struggling for a while and I said, eat some fat before CrossFit. I think your body still wants to run on glucose. That week he got shredded, his wow. abs came out. And so now he eats butter every morning. <laughs> yes. So. As I was listening to how you said you went for that whole year with just the beef and the water and the salt. Um, my question, and then you did weights. Do you oftentimes tell people not to worry about exercising yes. or lifting weights? Because Is that because of cortisol and how? Yes, how your central nervous weight? system. There are different types of exercise. So we have aerobic and anaerobic. Excess cardio can raise your cortisol and then you adapt to it and that's not a good situation. Mm -hmm. Going for a 15, 30 minute walk after you eat is good for pretty much anyone, I think. Mm -hmm. That's not too much. But if you're lifting heavy and your central nervous system is already in fight flight mode, it's probably not a good idea. Um, we work out to be strong and, and gain muscle, but you don't get those benefits unless you're recovering. And if your central nervous system is not healthy, you won't recover properly. You're just adding insult to injury. And mm -hmm. so what I say is try resistance training when you're up for it, but it's relative to where you're at. For me, I started with body weight, breathing and stretching in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then I was walking. And then I started during 2020, I was carrying around backpacks of frozen meat and walking around with that and doing squats with that. Then I got into the gym. Then I got into CrossFit. So it was a long journey of 
Where's my body at? What would be healthy? There's always a balance. And if you, if you're doing a workout and you start feeling anxious or you start just feeling like, uh, this is pushing it, don't do it. Just don't do it. I think a lot of people are like, well, to be healthy, I have to push myself. There's a difference between laziness and this is not a good idea. And you should be able to discern what that is. So um, let's say that you're like, I'm a pretty clean eater at home and like mostly carnivore. And I struggle with like probably less than 10 pounds, maybe even about five. And it just doesn't wanna like come off my body. And part of it is, I relish everything I eat, even though I eat like we're eating with meat and fat. So do I, would it, you suggest that I reduce the amount in my plate or I reduce the amount of fat in my plate? First, I would want to know how much protein and fat you're eating every day. Do you know what your macros are? No. I would start there. What you measure, you can manage. Yeah. I wouldn't just blindly pull back the fat because maybe you're not even getting enough. You can gain weight by not eating enough fat and you can gain weight by eating too much fat. So that's the kind of approach where you're just like taking it by the reins and you're like, I just wanna lose the weight, I'm gonna do what I think will work. A better approach would be track your macros. You don't have to do it every day, but just get an idea. And then also ask yourself, am I really overweight? Because you look really healthy to me. Your body might just want to maintain it a higher weight. That's another thing. But if you wanted to do it, I think a good approach is the higher protein days, lower fat. That's not a long-term approach. Like two days a week, just go lower fat so that you're burning more of your body fat. Okay. And that's and then you'll keep your metabolic rate higher. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, when do you recommend upon waking to have your first meal that goes with your hormones appropriately? Sure. And like also working out on fasted or eating? Yeah, good time. questions. So I really don't like eating first thing in the morning. I like to wait. What you could do, because it, it does support your cortisol to eat within 30 minutes of waking, what you could do instead is eat some pure fat, and that will send the same signal to your body. Mm -hmm. That's what I like to do. Um, and I can also feel when my body needs the extra fat and when I can just go work out fasted. Mm -hmm. I've worked out fasted for most of my life, and it has worked for me all throughout my healing journey. I never felt like, oh, I got to eat because I just woke up. I don't, I don't like eating when I'm not hungry. When you're leptin sensitive, you can trust your hunger signals and you will feel when that comes back and you honor that hunger. So I think it's really preference, but if you feel like you need the extra support, eat some pure fat when you wake up. Even half a tablespoon of butter will be enough to lower the cortisol and send that signal that you don't need to go into gluconeogenesis, you don't need to start making sugar for the body, you're not starving. And then as for workouts, I think um, when you are fat adapted, you can wait longer after a workout but it's still good to eat within two hours, I think, after a heavy workout, if you can. But you know, when you're fat adapted, you can wait longer and you won't be tapping into your muscle because ketones are muscle sparing. When you are burning fat for fuel and your body doesn't want glucose, then it's not gonna look to your muscles when it runs out of glucose. It'll look to your body fat because it wants fat. When you're burning glucose primarily, your muscles, you're in catabolism. Your muscles are always at risk unless you eat on the clock. So do you think um, if someone is typically like they strength training in the morning, fasted or not fasted, but um, then they're like feeling nauseous after, do you think maybe just doing that pure fat before would? I would try that. I would definitely try that, and I would also take electrolytes before. Electrolytes. Yeah. Tim. You mentioned that when you got out of the institution that you had binging yeah. issues. I have had binging issues. First it was, you know, the salty carbs, and then when I was testing blood sugar, it was like, it was the vegetables between my body, the carb, it's a carb. Now, I stick to carnivore, but I'm still having issues with binging on carnivore foods. However, I don't feel like it's an emotional event. I think it just tastes so good, so it's like, I still, you know, what what did you do to, to get over your binging that you, you mentioned? It was definitely a process. Um, I will say that, like, I was triggered by everything to binge. I remember the first time, it was the first time Tyler kissed me, I binged that night because I was excited. It wasn't just stress, I was excited. It was like 10 o'clock, I was like, I have to eat. <laughs> and. 
it, I don't know if it was binging, but it was impulsive eating. Mm. And I could tell that my adrenaline was higher and that triggered me. And it's taken a while to get away from that. But to get over the binging itself, um, you have to know yourself, can I do sweet things? Like when I first started making my brownies, I would portion them out and put them in my freezer because in the bottom of my chest freezer, because then I would have to dig it out. I would allow myself certain portions at a time. Now I can be in this house and it's like, eh, I don't really want a second serving of sweet things. Um, with carnivore foods, if I felt the urge to binge, I would allow myself to get some flank and style short ribs or something decadent, really good that I don't normally eat that's carnivore. Another major thing is eating enough protein. I think everyone is high fat is healing and it's awesome, but we can also do high protein. We can also do one gram of protein per pound of desired body weight or even a little bit more. There's a reason that your body is still wanting to binge. So if I were in your shoes, is it your central nervous system? Is it your cortisol? Are you sleeping through the night? Are you getting enough protein? Are you dehydrated? There are so many different variables. Um, there could just be one nutrient that your body wants and you're gonna want more and more food until it gets it. Like so Lisa had me recognize that, you know, it does, part of it is compulsion. Yeah. You know, I was used to nine o'clock, winding down in bed, this is time to eat. So that part I recognize that I try to overcome, but. Yeah. Yes. So you were talking about, you had the, the issues when you were in Durham, North Carolina, and then you went into the facility for, you know, to, because you had, you had an eating disorder, you know, you were so sick, you were on all these medications, which is just, Unbelievable to me that they just kept giving you medication after medication after medication. 300 rounds of antibiotics, good lord. But my question is now that you're where you are, does your family acknowledge that you went out and you healed your own body and you healed yourself? And have any of them been apologetic for that? Or have any of them come on board with like the carnivore diet? Or have you helped any of them heal their problems, their eating problems, and the fact that you did not have an eating disorder? Definitely. Um, now I did have a binge eating disorder after the eating disorder unit, so it's kind of like, yeah, I did go through that, but um, they have apologized. And it's very hard because, you know, if I put myself in their shoes, what would you have done if your child was 69 pounds and wouldn't eat anything but a ketogenic diet? And tracking all of her macros and testing her blood sugar every day, that was my life. It looked like an eating disorder. And so when the doctor pulled my mom aside and said, you're, you're daughter has to be hooked up to a feeding tube um, she I remember she turned white in the face my mom was a ghost and I was like what did that nurse just tell you because I went to the hospital for autoimmune issues and then a nurse petitioned to have me sent to the eating disorder unit I was held in the psych ward for a day then they moved me to the crisis ward and then they got me into the eating disorder unit it was horrible um, and so they definitely scared my parents into believing and so there's there are apologies and forgiveness on both sides my mom cannot read my book she never will. It was such a dark and painful time for her. And I'm sure it was for my dad too. My sister apologized. She's like, I just didn't know how to help. I didn't know what was going on. I get it. Um, and then in terms of their health, my sister has had grand mal seizures my whole life. She has epilepsy. So she's tried keto. It does make a difference, but she also doesn't want to live eating keto. She wants to be able to eat peaches and things that she wants. And that's her choice. That's really hard for me. It's really hard to see my sister still struggle but she's improving and it's her life. Um, my dad has had chronic pain my whole life. His pain has gotten a lot better. He definitely goes through seasons of he wants his treats and he wants his Chinese food and seed oils. Um, my mom hates it. My mom is, she does whatever I recommend. She makes jerky now. She makes the equipped foods shakes every day. She's like, just tell me how to be healthy. How do I get my wrinkles down? <laughs> um, and she wants to do weightlifting and eat enough protein. So my mom is totally on board and interested. They all have come to me for advice now. Oh, that's awesome. And they definitely trust me. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask if other family members had issues because you couldn't be the only one. Kind of like the oh, yeah. Michaela Peterson, her dad. I mean, my whole family has issues, especially my mom's side. There's cancer, like, there's mood disorders. In there definitely. Yeah, I have a lot of, my genetics are pretty bad. I had the MTHFR gene mutation, I still have it, but it doesn't give me any issues anymore. Um, there are a lot of genetic issues, but epigenetics is more powerful. How do you get your wrinkles down? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have any wrinkles. <laughs> you look 
great. Yeah. Eat enough protein. Definitely eat enough protein. If you want your skin to be tight, intermittent fasting so that you're inducing autophagy and you're you're burning up, recycling dead proteins, but then eating enough protein throughout the day. If you're not eating enough protein, you won't maintain your skeletal muscle. Um, collagen is huge, but like we're getting tons of collagen this week. Not from the collagen powder, but from the meats. Any meat with a bone has collagen. Um, enough fat is huge. I don't know how much wrinkle reversage you can really do, but I definitely think that this is a reverse aging diet. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, don't they say that autophagy doesn't kick in until after 36 hours? But so, do you think that a 16-8 approach is still better, but maybe with the exercise to it depends. Doesn't that increase the autophagy? Autophagy significantly increases mm -hmm. after 36 hours, but you're still going through rates of it even when you exercise. Mm -hmm. If you go for a jog, you're inducing autophagy to some degree. So when you're fasting overnight and you're fat adapted and you're not eating carbs, none of us are eating carbs. We are burning, we're at higher rates of autophagy even when we're eating. So it doesn't take as much for us to get the benefits from autophagy. Now someone who's eating a bro diet but is heavy working out, you know, some of these influencers on Instagram and stuff with six packs, they have a lot of autophagy going on. But they're also restricting their calories, their hormones are jacked up, they have cystic acne. They're hangry all the time. So I think this is a more sustainable approach. Mm -hmm. Do you have plans to kind of go down another um, line of products for babies or like diets and things like that? Because I don't think it's much different than what we're doing. Um, I plan on sharing, you know, what we do with David, yeah. but I'm just going to give him first foods will be egg yolks, liver, um, bone marrow, bone broth, you know, animal foods. Um, I don't think it's much different. Babies are were born into ketosis, all of us. Mm -hmm. It's not much different, but I feel like some people need to see it. Like, yeah, I might, you know, I'll make posts for it. I thought about doing a separate page, but yeah. I don't really want our kid on his own Instagram. I don't right. want his face on there as much yeah. and stuff, so I'll, I'll make posts <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> I mean, I'll, we'll share his face, yes, but no one will see his penis. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I definitely really. I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm popular enough for some creep to use it. I think some people have to be more careful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I just have a comment. I appreciate that you attribute your healing to God, even though I respect that. It, I don't want to cry. I just think you went through so much, mm -hmm. and um, that was so hard. And I've seen your your um, testimony before with other interviewers. But that you attribute it to God. And I just want to say this morning, I saw the Bible and I opened it up and I turned it to Psalm 91. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. I did too in the bathroom. I was reading it with my red light in the bathroom. I should share this today. Mm -hmm. Amen to that, April. I just want to say, and I hope this works for me too, clearly you have your mind back, your memory. I have memory issues. Mm -hmm. Even, I'm 61, but I worry about it because I have I struggle, so I use these techniques to remember yeah. names and stuff. And I hope I have that. You can. I mean, you're still here talking with us. I definitely don't think you're too far gone. I would definitely incorporate some DHA, <laughs> DHA fat, brain, if you can tolerate it. Um, I have a brain queso recipe. It's not gross. It doesn't taste gross. You it just blend. Gross. You blend <laughs> brain. <laughs> I know it sounds gross. <laughs> It's not gross, and it's so good for you. It's going to be so much better than fish oil capsules. But gets a lot of DHA fat for your for your brain health for sure. I do have better memory. Let's get better. Good. <laughs> oh yeah. How did you reverse yourself of fibrosis and insomnia? Yes. So osteoporosis um, and degenerative disc, which is something else I had, you can reverse both of those just by eating the proper nutrients. Our bones are most, it's not mostly calcium, it's, it's protein that we need. Eat enough protein. And then also resistance training. So when you put that pressure on your bones, it, it makes them grow just like your muscles. Um, if you don't want to do resistance training, just even vibration, you know, get a whole, stand on a vibration plate. Those are great for your bone density. Um, I've worked with a lot of people to reverse osteoporosis. Most of them are 
over 55 years old, and I've seen reversal, like with just this way of eating. Many of them take medications and have been able to get off of it completely while maintaining, I'm eating enough protein every day. I'm lifting five pound weights, you know, whatever's good for your um, resistance level, what's rel relative for you. It's really that simple, is getting the proper nutrients. We do need calcium, so I do get mine from bones. You could do eggshells or dairy. You need vitamin D, vitamin K, um, and protein and fat. And then for the insomnia, I think the main thing with that was getting into an environment that my that I felt safe. So when I moved in to Tyler's room, I definitely started sleeping better almost immediately. Um, but I wasn't sleeping through the night yet, and that was a slow process. Like it started out with me waking up at 8.30 and not feeling like I couldn't get out of bed. Like, I can get out of bed today. And now it's I wake up at five every morning and I have great energy. Even during pregnancy, my energy is not like it was, but it's still pretty decent. And so it's a long process of supporting your body. Go to bed early if you need to go to bed early. There was a long season where I would get into bed at 5 p.m. And that is your central nervous system healing. If you've been in fight flight for years, you will go through a season where all you want to do is sit still, maybe cry. It's literally your central nervous system saying, I'm safe again. I'm okay. And so you need to give your body that season and um, you'll get more comfortable, you know, being able to stay up late and things like that. I tried a lot of supplements before I found this way of eating before God delivered me. I tried all the supplements. I was stacking phenylanine, tyrosine, um, 5-HTP, relora all the things and it really didn't make a difference and so supporting your central nervous system is going to be huge and then also making sure you're eating enough if you're hungry then your body is going to wake you up to eat more mm -hmm. thank you so much for your story it's very inspiring um i it, it jarred a memory for me when i was a teenager um i i was developing like severe side stomach pain and I think it was because of, you know, the family dynamic that was going on. It was manifesting itself mm -hmm. in my gut, which makes a lot of sense. And I remember my mom had to rush me to the doctor because I was in such severe pain and they were thinking it was appendicitis. Wow. And, um, and then the doctor, our family doctor, I, I just, I don't think he could figure it out. What was going on? And, and I remember the answer was, well, put her on Metamucil and get fiber in her. Um, and, and so I remember like these horrible like Venabusil drinks oh that, um, you know, I was having to drink and I, I don't think it did a damn thing <laughs> other than make me feel, I don't know, worse. Um, and then I've, all, and I've suffered throughout my life with um, digestive issues and at some point had my gallbladder taken out and I don't, and I questioned that decision greatly now because then I had the side effects, the ramifications right. from that now for the you know past 10 plus years. Um, what I'm getting to is I, I just I wanted to share that because I, I think um, you know I too have in a way have suffered from like the medical community not understanding what I'm going mm -hmm. through. First of all, you know, not I've never being asked like, well, what are you eating? Yeah. <laughs> like right. ever. Right. Um, and I know I know doctors because I've talked to one here, it's it's tough because the reaction from the from the patients can be very defensive. Definitely. Um, and um, and it's it's like a no go zone after a while. Um, yeah. And uh, so there, it's just like I don't want to touch that or or they they might kind of broach it a little bit and then if the patient's very defensive they just back off and yep. well here's a pill right mm -hmm. um so that too and then and then but then also some of the like some of the like poor advice that i've gotten <laughs> on how to or even surgery right to like yeah. deal with with that um but I, I remember the Metamucil and I, and, I, and I remember like sort of the drumbeat of fiber that, you know, fiber is so important. And I've got one of my dear friends, like she thinks that is the answer to everything. And she's like, I poop a lot, you know, and, 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 and like that's a badge of honor, right. um, how much she poops. <laughs> and, and I and like she thinks it's a medicinal thing is going on, but I'm cleaning everything out, you know. 
Can you just like yeah. reflect on fiber? <laughs> it's fiber is a horrible idea for anyone who's ever had colon cancer. Um, especially certain, I mean, certain types of fiber, like leafy greens, they, they scrub your system. They're actually very irritating to your colon. <coughs> I'm not against the shirataki noodles cause it's very smooth and slimy. Um, some people have better bowel movements with those. I'm like, great. It's zero, practically zero carbs, zero oxalate. If you like your bowel movements better, go ahead and have them, but you don't <laughs> need fiber. You do not need fiber. Um, and you don't need it to feed your microbiome. Less diversity is not a bad thing. I actually think it's better. Fiber, any type of fiber or vegetation can feed candida. It can feed SIBO. So if you have bad bacteria present, no fiber is probably a better idea. Um, the only potential benefit I see coming from fiber is that it can buffer the release of glucose into your bloodstream. So if you're eating like a bolus of protein, if you break it up with fiber, it will release into your bloodstream slower and you might not have as much of a rise in your glucose. That's kind of a cool benefit, but it's not necessary. And when we're not eating carbs, we really don't need to even think about that. Um, so fiber, I think the whole fiber talk is ridiculous. <laughs> It's ridiculous. I'm sorry you went through that. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Are you still using the, um, the sauna? Yeah, yeah. So when I got pregnant, um, before I got pregnant, I loved to sweat my brains out in my sauna every morning. But then when I got pregnant, I was like, I need something else. So I got a, um, it's by Cozy Light. I'm affiliated with them. It's a panel, so I don't sweat as much, but I'm still getting the red light and the infrared. I do that every morning. Do you think you'll go back to the sauna or you'll stay with the... No, I like sweating. Okay. I just, I don't do it because I'm pregnant. I shouldn't be sweating that much, but mm -hmm. I love sweating. I think it's one of the best, one of the best things you can do for your skin, for your lymph, for detox. Um, my clients who are, you know, detoxing Lyme disease or, or mold toxicity, things like that, sweating is huge. It's a much better method than taking a bunch of herbals and forcing detox when your body's not ready to. Your skin looks amazing. Yeah, Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, don't laugh. Okay. I don't sweat. <laughs> okay, I hear that a lot. Have you ever sweat? Yes, I did hot yoga for five years. Okay, 105 degrees I for 90 hot minutes. Yoga. <laughs> and I sweat, but it took me the first hour. I mean, I have friends that the, there's a puddle on the bottom, okay? And then I spend four nights a week, and they have a puddle. And I don't even have like anything. Mm -hmm. I try to dry brush. Mm -hmm, that's good. Is that what That's I'm great for moving lymph. Okay. But why um, am I sweating? So usually when people aren't sweating, I like to look at the thyroid. Mm -hmm. Have you t done like a full thyroid panel? I you? have. Is it good? Um, I'm in the parameters. Okay. okay. Have you done reverse T3 as well? Uh, no. I would do that one. Okay. That will paint the full picture. Okay. That's the first thing I would do if you're not sweating. And then also look at, are you drinking enough electrolytes? You know, if you're dehydrated, your body's not gonna want to sweat. I know, I'm probably dehydrated. Yeah, I drink a lot of electrolytes, so, so I sweat called, like that. It's called reverse T3? Reverse T3 or RT3. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I didn't get the full panel of thyroid, but I, I have the, Positive antibodies. So okay. I think I have you do. If you have any, you have yeah. Hashimoto's. Um, so I take iodine, I take vitamin D3 with the E2, and I'm not completely low carb, and I, I haven't been super strict, but she eats carbs, everyone. <laughs> 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 No. I don't think so. I think you need to get metabolically flexible and fat adapted. You're also a pretty tiny person. You, maybe your body wants a little bit more body fat. Um, <laughs> you're like, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, I would definitely just focus on being fat adapted. Do okay. you feel like you need the carbs to sleep and to have energy? Yes, but I've tried the butter and it gives me the runs if I have it yeah. on its own. Even if like a little bit, I've tried a tiny bit. Try raw suet. Yeah, I do have some of that. So do I'll that. I mean, it's always a catch-22 with, oh, I want to go high fat for my hormones, but now it's giving me diarrhea. Yeah. So many people run into yeah. that. So try the raw suet, go slowly. Mm -hmm. But becoming mm -hmm. metabolically flexible will protect your body. It will, it will help your thyroid feel like it's fully supported. Okay. Um, also, you might consider taking selenium 
which is also essential for your thyroid. It's iodine, zinc, and selenium. You wanna be sure you're getting enough of. You're probably getting enough if you're eating enough meat every day. We don't need that much selenium. Iodine is a huge one. How much of that do you take? So I think I have the wiggles 2% and I put usually four drops. Okay, that's good. So with hypothyroidism, you don't wanna to take too much. I think uh, okay. four drops is perfect. Okay. Um, if you're going back to your doctor anytime and running it again, if you haven't seen any improvement, I would increase it by one drop. Okay. You just want to be sure you're not going backwards. Everyone's a little bit different, but I think four drops is a really great place to be. Mm -hmm. I think maybe just becoming metabolically flexible would be the next step I would take you through for that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And, and healing and sealing your gut for any autoimmune issue. Okay. I was just thinking, healing your gut. How do you really know when your gut is healed? Yeah. Um, so for me, for me, it's really obvious because I've had so many gut issues. Like I could feel when the C. diff would take over after every fecal transplant. I felt it in my mood, my personality. I can just feel when it's off. Um, but I would say for you guys, you shouldn't be having symptoms. Um, you, know, you shouldn't have be having skin rashes or digestive issues all the time, or mood issues. Those are all rooted in the gut. Um, those are the main, main ones that come to mind, but you will, you will feel it. You'll feel more at peace. I think the mood is probably the main one. Yeah, and, and you can always test for gut permeability and stuff like that, but I think listening to how you feel is number one. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Since you do sauna, do you, do you ever do cold plunge? Are you using that? Um, during my healing, I would sleep on ice packs because it tonifies your vagus nerve, which helps digestion and your central nervous system. I've never, the only cold plunge I did was two Christmases ago. I went in Lake Michigan on Christmas Day. Um, and it really hurt my feet. It was really uncomfortable. I thought I was going to lose my feet, so I didn't do that again. Um, I do cold water on my face every morning. It's a great way to lower cortisol. You can stick your head in a bowl of ice and you get the same effect. Mm -hmm. I do cool my shower down at the end, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I don't do cold plunges. I'm not sure if I ever will because I really don't like them. <laughs> but I think cold therapy is, all, is very therapeutic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked about washing your hair. Oh, yeah, I haven't. I'm very curious because I try to just go three days. Yeah. I can't imagine how you're like, yeah. liking your hair. <laughs> so I haven't washed my hair since November of last year. Wow. I have not used any products. I use apple cider vinegar maybe once every two months, which is a clar it clarifies. So if there's any sebum buildup on your scalp, you want to definitely take care of that. You can lose your hair if there's too much buildup. I did this because Tyler tried it first. He came across someone who wasn't washing his hair. And he's like, I'm going to do this. He was a grease ball for two weeks. <laughs> and then one morning he woke up and he's like, it's normal. And I was like, no way. And I was like, it's normal. It just normalized. So if you stop stripping your hair of the oils all the time, it will start to balance out and your scalp will develop a healthy pH. I didn't go through a greasy phase. I got some dandruff for like two days and then it's gotten better and better. Um, I will say when my hair dries completely, my curls look a lot better than it's not usually this frizzy as you guys see right now, but my hair has never been healthier, thicker. It's not greasy. You can smell it if you want. Um, <laughs> I save so much time and money. Oh, uh, so I literally just brush it with a wet brush. I have videos, um, put it up in my hair block, which, which is a cotton t-shirt and that's it. So, cause of the times that I have time, I just become a grease ball. Yeah. So just wait a few weeks. Just you should wait it out. You should wait it out. And you could always wean down. Like before I did no washing, I was only washing once a week. Before that, I was washing twice a week. Okay. So you can always wean yourself down. Um, I didn't wash my hair for five and a half years. Ooh, yes. I love your hair. Well, thank you. I do wash it now because of <laughs> like curly girl method. I had stick straight hair and all of a sudden I was like, oh, maybe I have some waves. Yeah. So I started doing some, oh, it's not great right now. I do all the things. But, um, so I started after five and a half years, um, I gave it up to try something different, Yeah. you know, just, uh, and that's been great. However, I realized my mistake and I just want to say it so that none of you do this because there's so many no poo methods out there Yeah. and I did baking soda mm -hmm. and then apple cider vinegar mm -hmm. and, and you know, just on the ends. 
to see oh, that'll dry it out. Bake it. Exactly. Yeah. So, it, but it got to where the baking soda made my hair so silky, I yeah. no longer needed the apple cider vinegar. Yeah. And that was great for a couple of years, but eventually it completely dried it out. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I don't the people do who it. say that. Yeah. Or don't think, oh, I'm going to save a step. And so if you're able yes, to achieve thank you for just apple cider that. vinegar, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And not frequently. I'm tempted to because whenever I do it, it's super silky and smooth. Yeah. But I know it'll dry it off. I yeah. Do mine it was the baking soda was super silky, so I was like, oh, I'll just get yeah. that other on the end thing, and it ruined my hair. Yeah. So, so do you just plug the apple cider vinegar like that? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe two <laughs> tablespoons, dunk it for a minute, let it soak <laughs> in, brush it out. That's it. Wow. In the, in the shower. shower. Do you yeah. The apple cider yeah. Vinegar? I'm standing in the shower while I'm doing that. Okay. Do you, do you dilute it right back? Right? No. So just that, like, yeah, just a bottle of apple cider, and it is always in our shower. <laughs> wow. Is it right? Yes, yes. usually. Um, do you ever do anything with castor oil? No. It's a seed oil. So I know it has benefits, but I am super picky about seed oils. And so when I'm questioning something, I look up the linoleic acid, how much percentage. I think castor oil is, I think it's 30%. Yeah. I don't touch olive oil. I don't touch avocado oil. I will eat avocados, but I really don't that much. I am super stubborn about seed oils because they have such a long half-life mm -hmm. and I've had so much chronic pain in my life and mood disorders I don't want to mess with them um, but I'm not against it I think if it helps someone then it could be beneficial I, I've been trying to transition a lot of my health care beauty products over to non-toxic yeah. um, I downloaded the app think dirty mm -hmm. uh, to look at the ingredients and then they rate products in there um, but I've noticed like a lot of lotions that are sort of categorized as healthy do have seed oils yeah. in them. What do you think about that in terms of lotion? I'm very particular. I know Lisa is as well. We are both affiliated with, you're with Clara and Fritz now? Yeah, I mean, there's so many companies. There are. Noeg Balm, yeah. Clara and Fritz, Spearhead Soaps, none of them have seed oils. A lot of them do, but those are the three I'm affiliated with. I know Lisa has codes as well, but I love their products, and I also I I forgot my bathroom bag for this trip, so all my makeup, all my products. So I bought a jar of beef tallow, and I've been washing my face with that this whole week. Really? I do not touch seed oils, and especially facial care products. Yeah, I was surprised because they they are classified as non toxic and, yeah. and healthy. A lot of those products, and then I was. I know. Digging I, into the ingredients, I'm like, wait a minute, that's a seed oil that they're, <laughs> that they're a, putting in there. I so. found a bag of my they're whole foods. Go ahead. Those people aren't carnivore people. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And they're not as stringent on ingredients as absorbed into your bloodstream but I see the potential for benefits yeah. if it helps someone with their detox process or whatever and you're not eating any other seed oils it's really probably not a problem I am super strict about it I'm like this is my orthorexia side <laughs> I would be fine if I did it I just don't I don't want to even get into it um, but I think castor oil packs work for a lot of people and I'm not against it is coconut oil seed oil? no coconut oil is not but olive and avocado are mm -hmm. coconut oil is it's a saturated fat. It does have salicylic acid, which is in a lot of face wash. That's what dries out your pimples. So it can be irritating to your gut. Mm. So animal foods are, animal fats are always the best for anyone healing their gut. And you don't get your vitamin A, E, D, E, and K from, from plant fats, from coconut oil. You get it from animal fats. Mm. You don't get conjugated linoleic acid, steric acid. The cacao butter is the only plant fat that I really consume much of um, because it's the richest source, source of steric acid. But coconut oil is not bad. It's just not the best bang for your buck. Okay. Can we go back to the hair just a Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because I'm interested in, you know, yeah. switching. Yeah. yeah. How often, like, yeah. do, do you wash your hair with apple cider vinegar? Only once every two months or so. Exactly. Okay. Not often. Like, and I, I did, know, I did like, the I was curly just making sort of very, yeah. very like, not like, a lot. two weeks or something I washed my hair. Not no. And 
And if I feel like, if I have like a dreadlock in the back of my head, I'll put a little bit in there and I'll glide right through. Mm -hmm. But I don't like do my scalp treatment very often at all. You did it on your scalp? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's been six weeks since I've washed my hair. Yeah, wow. it's been great. Yeah. So, I had first two weeks, super greasy. <laughs> yeah, it was gross. Like I was like, oh, but I just kept it up. And I mean, I've, I've been on vacation, so it was it, it's worked for me. But wow. um, yeah, it, you don't have to keep brushing it through to get it off. Okay, so, so like when I take a shower, yeah, I just brush it out. I brush it out. Brush it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It. Yeah. Oh wait a minute, I want to get this straight. So <laughs> you wet it when you're in the shower? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so. I wet it I wet it like once every five days maybe. Three to five days, depends on how sweaty CrossFit was. It depends if I was playing with the dogs and there's dirt in my hair. Do you have a charcoal filter in your in your shower? Um no we don't. I would like one. Yeah. Um <laughs> and I have two brushes. I have a wet brush. So I just stand in the water, brush it out, and then I flip my head upside down and brush it again before I put it up in my plop. Okay. Yeah. Just, just water. Just water. I'm gonna do, do it. it in your yeah, my plop. Oh, my cotton t-shirt. I'm gonna try it. She's a video on it. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So between you and Nisha Berry, I quit coloring my hair three years ago. One of my Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, and I've tried the hair plop. I haven't quite mastered that. I feel like whenever I take my wrap off, like it's caked to my head. <laughs> um, okay. What, did you have to deal with frizz when you were first starting this? Because that's my problem. I, I put product in my hair to tame the frizz because it was wild. And there was no way I could go three days without wetting my hair. Because I know what you mean. The it's the plop. It's I'm the serious. Plop. That okay. I Every night I put a little bit of water on my hair and then put it back in the plop. I can show you how to do it. I think it's mad at your head. You you can kind of loosen it and make sure it's not like smashing your hair down. So there's a little room in there. Not as loose as like a hair bonnet, but so there's some room in there. Okay. Yeah, it can takes practice. Demo tonight? Mm -hmm. I can do that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> so when is your birthday? April 14th. Wow. <laughs> when is the baby due? January 18th. Although he's measuring January 8th. I oh, think we're going to have a big baby. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.